Welcome friends. That's the interesting point Alan just made that I don't speak from notes. When I first came to this country in the 60s and spoke here, this very thing which he has today praised as a qualification that I speak without notes was considered a disqualification. That he is a man who's unread, ill-read, knows nothing, has no notes, he's just uh, shooting off the cuff what he thinks, he's no good. In fact, I had to keep blank papers with me and open them out <laughs> to look learned enough. Which, of course, uh, reminds me of a story some of you have heard and others may like to enjoy about a great scientist who went to an international convention to speak on a technical subject. And when he arrived at that city, Nobody knew him. He was an international scientist from another country. And he hired a taxi, taxi cab, to go to the convention center. The taxi cab driver was a very intelligent cab driver. He saw the name of this scientist on the baggage. And he knew this is that world-known scientist who has come to speak there. He felt very proud that I am the cabbie hired for this great ride to the convention center. But on the way, he spoke to the scientist and he said, Sir, do you know, from my childhood, I had a great ambition and desire to be a worldwide well-known scientist. And I tried very hard, but I ended up becoming a cabbie, a cabbie driver. And you have become that scientist, which was my ambition. The scientist thought for a moment and he said, would you like to fulfill your ambition at least for one day? And the cab driver said, how? He said, the point is, the speech I have to make at the convention is all written down and typed out. Why don't you read it out and get the honor of being that scientist for one day? The cab driver promptly accepted the offer. They changed seats. The scientist became the cab driver. The cab driver's road as a scientist was received at the convention hall. And the cab driver just went into the audience, sat down, and the cab and the scientist sat in the audience like a cab driver. The cab driver held those typed pages, the script in his hand, those papers, and he began to read. And he astounded the scientist with the beautiful presentation that was already in those papers. But when he was coming towards the end, being an intelligent cab driver, he realized somebody may ask questions after this. So to make sh sure that he doesn't get trapped into that, he ended his speech by saying, now, ladies and gentlemen, I have made things so plain, I'm sure there can be no questions. But one young scientist sitting in the front row, he raised his hand. He said, no, sir, when such a well-known scientist like you comes, at least we must ask one question. And he proceeded to ask the question without giving him time to say anything. He said, you referred to that extra X-rays and gamma rays in the 6th billion galaxy. How do you think it's going to affect the other studies that have been done with the quasars? The cab driver thought, looked at him. He said, young man, I made things so clear and you have still asked such a simple question. Even the cab driver sitting next to you can answer it. <laughs> so much for written texts. The truth is, I can speak without paper because I always say the same thing. <laughs> but I say it in different words. And people still come to two lectures and they say, wow, we heard one and this one. And great, it was a different lecture. Then I begin to feel maybe they never understood the first one either. <laughs> words have a great limitation. The spoken word has a very limited capacity to communicate. And the reason is simple. In any language, when we speak with a word, that spoken word only means to the listener what is the connotation with that sound. The connotation comes from the association of ideas of the listener with that sound, that is the word. And since no two people have had the same association of ideas with the same words, when somebody speaks, that person who speaks thinks, I am saying what I know. Each one in the audience is listening and understanding differently according to what they know about the words. And so everybody is happy 
but none the wiser for such spoken language. This is a natural disadvantage of using the spoken language for communication. Sometimes I wonder whether I should stop uh, giving spoken lectures and should start doing telepathic com communication. So come, stand here, begin. After an hour, say it's end. <laughs> and say, have you all understood it? I tried that once. Very surprisingly, in one of my government jobs. In India, <clears throat> in one of my government jobs, I was required to take care of refugees from Bangladesh who had to come into India and we had to resettle them during the war. And those refugees dreamed in they spoke Bengali with which I was not familiar at all. I didn't know them. A lot of them were full of anger, full of outrage at what had happened to their country. They wanted to kill anybody who tried to call them refugees. And there was a strange psychological phenomenon going on. And I, as one of the civil servants working in the federal government, was deputed to go to those tribal areas next to the border with that country and resettle them in new areas. They didn't want to be resettled. They wanted to go back to their homeland. And they were, many of them were Islamic fundamentalists who were so strong in their beliefs and so keen to kill. In fact, I saw one officer, an assistant of mine trying to talk them and they were saying something in Bengali. I said, what does that mean? The translator, my interpreter said, it means kill him. <laughs> so I said, this is the strange assignment I have got. This is the strangest assignment I have ever got. So I went there and I stood with them and I wouldn't speak. And they said, who is this new administrator has come? And uh, they had a hard time accepting me. All the time I thought, this time I'll probably get killed. This is my retirement assignment. <laughs> but gradually, without being able to speak their language, they began to feel that I was understanding their problems because by gestures and by uh, situations like going into a kitchen and start cooking and showing them food, which they wanted. They could understand that he is talking the same language without speaking any words. I'll give you one example of that stay of mine when I went in the middle of the night and I wanted to talk to those people what their demands were. I took an interpreter with me and I went to them. Middle of the night, I got late in arriving. Midnight, they were waiting till 7 o'clock in the evening. I thought most of them must have gone back, but they were all waiting. Young children, men, women, old people, with strange white beards, all kind of people were there. And I got out of my jeep and walked up, sat with them. My interpreter came up. He said, the administrator wants to know what are your demands. What do you want him to do for you? They brought out a piece of paper in which they listed 15 demands. If you want us to live here, you must give us proper homes. You must give water supply. You must give food. You must give this 15 comfort creature points listed out on the paper. They spoke out. My interpreter translated for me and I was quiet. And I kept on shaking my head. When 15 points were read out, I said to the interpreter, tell them I am unhappy. I am not thinking of these things at all. I am thinking of point number 16 and 17. They haven't even written down. So he told them, he is very unhappy and sad. He was hoping to read point number 16 and 17, which you failed to write down. And they said like this. I saw children doing like this and there was great upheaval amongst them and they said, he's our man, he understands us. They fell in so much love with me, they ran to the federal headquarters when I had to leave for another assignment and wouldn't let me go. Till today, I am standing here, I don't know what point number 16 and 17 was. It's a, it's a very simple, a simple thing that what they wanted was, is there a human being who can know us? Is there somebody who identifies with us? Because in the ultimate analysis, what counts in life? In this drama of life that we are going through, the only real thing that counts eventually, we may go through any experience you will find at the end of it, the only thing that counts is, did you have an experience of love or not? If you haven't had it, you missed out. You missed out on life if you didn't experience love. And if you had it, you fulfilled it. 
and what is love but an experience of identification with another? What is love but forgetting who you are and knowing what the beloved is? If you can put yourself in somebody else's place, you know what is love. You want to try it out? Try tomorrow. For one week from tomorrow, when you go out and talk to anybody, listen to anybody, communicate with anybody in any context, in business, in home, in family matters, with, with friends, with anybody, when you talk, forget where you are talking from. Forget who you are. Assume you are the person you are talking to. As if you are that person with that feeling. Try it for one week. The whole world will love you after that. You'll be a different person. It is as simple as that. This is one area where we are deficient. And this is one area where our consciousness gives us the highest faculty, which nobody else has. Only human be beings are endowed with the capacity to love and receive love. And we are missing out on that by trying to cultivate relationships based upon attachments, which are not the same thing as love. Attachments are based upon our own ego, our own individuality, our ambition, our I-ness. I love you. How dare you not love me? I love you. If you say I hate you, I hate you too. That kind of relationship. These kind of relationships where we do not identify with the other, where the self does not efface itself and identify with the beloved, those are not relationships of love. They don't last. They break. And if you look at our sad story, the sad story in this drama, why are we sad on this great theater, on this great stage? We are sad because we haven't loved, we haven't been loved, and the love broke too soon, and we were disappointed, and we, our, our, our expectations were too high. And how could she do it? And how could he do it? Is messing us up. Isn't that true? In all our, all our lives, whether they are parents, whether they are children, whether they are brothers and sisters, whether they are friends, we are being disappointed constantly because we do not have love. We have expectations based upon our relations which are not at all based on love. These relationships that we create here, they create so much entanglement for our consciousness. That even a person who wants to get out of this mess and wants to meditate and escape and find some peace and solitude and shuts his eyes and sits in a lotus posture and thinks he's gone away, finds that those very relationships and those very attachments, which were called love but are really attachments, they come in front of the eyes like a screen and they move in front and they speak and sneer and joke and they make the meditational life as miserable as they make the real life outside. What is the good of this kind of attachment? We are messing up a drama which could otherwise be a wonderful place to be in and a wonderful show to watch. I tell you from experience that if you use love as your only instrument of relationship with the world, there is no way that you will not enjoy this drama. There is no way that you will be unhappy and sad even with the same lives that you are leading now. It makes such a big difference. So in this great drama of life, we have to be very sure that we do not mix up attachments with love and go on harping on the fact that we had so many expectations. In love, there is no expectation. If there is an expectation, it is what the beloved expects because you are identifying with the beloved. That is the secret. Some of these great spiritual teachers of the East, these great masters, that we associated with sat quietly, but from their eyes and from their smiles flowed a kind of love that we became receptive to. And we would rejoice and feel so great. And the atmosphere was such that we could walk out in intoxication and wonder where it came from. Not from what they said, not from what they did, but from the very fact that they were overflowing with love and it affected us, it affected our hearts. And that is why we could come out and be affecting other people. We would walk and they said, look at this intoxicated fellow, must be doing a lot of meditation. If we say, we don't meditate, they say, you must be, how can you be so intoxicated? We ourselves did not know that when we can experience that love with a spiritual master, that is meditation. That the highest meditation is the experience of love. That all other mechanical meditations fail. 
when i was at harvard in massachusetts a friend of mine was very keen on understanding and practicing eastern meditation he tried many kinds zen system and he followed the other six chakra system from the boston yoga center he tried several systems and he tried one after the other and he could not succeed because the harder he tried the more tired he got the harder he tried the more stuck he got with one kind of experience he didn't know what was the road block what was stopping him i once suggested to him maybe the road block is you are trying too hard maybe you are putting in too much effort and i said that real meditation and real spiritual experience would not require such a great effort and i said some texts in the sanskrit which i read in translation in the widener library in the university here these texts speak of the highest achievement in spiritual elevation in enlightenment comes effortlessly i said baby we are putting too much effort why not try it effortlessly and he said i'll do it i left the university and he wrote a letter to me after 6 months he wrote a letter to me my dear ishwar you are right effort is not the answer i found out that was our mistake that we think that effort can make meditation succeed it doesn't i tried very hard with all the effort i could put in it didn't give me the results now i know effortless is the method so i am now going to try very hard effortlessly <laughs> we are caught in a trap what was wrong how come he got caught in the trap to try with effort and now try without effort and try he must for one simple reason that all the actions we take whether with effort without effort any approach we make any seeking we do any search we do is with the mind when the human mind the thinking mind is used you have to make effort whether you like it or not there is no instrument available with the mind to proceed except by effort a mind that says let me do it makes an effort the mind that says i won't do it restrains itself makes an effort the mind that wants to be active makes an effort the mind that decides not to be active makes an effort these decisions by the mind automatically employ an effort a use of will a use of free will and therefore we get trapped and don't move any forward how can one do effortless meditation effortless meditation comes from the soul the spirit that part of human consciousness which is not the mind it does not come from thinking the harder you think and meditate with those thoughts the less you get any results and if you don't think that is there something else in consciousness to use besides thought of course that is the greatest contribution that the eastern masters made to the study of human consciousness that they could indicate to us that the mind is not the only conscious process that we possess that the mind only produces three kinds of activities one sensing which means the sense perceptions pick up elements from around creation and we interpret and get to know now we are seeing this now this is a cup this is a table this is a chair the mind tells us what we are seeing what we are hearing what we are touching tasting and smelling the sensory process gives the input which makes no sense till the sensing mind the lower part of the mind tells us what it is the second the middle part of the mind interprets and rationalizes and uses logic it is constantly rationalizing and arguing within ourselves in a logical way a logical way means it must be in a sequence it must have a cause and effect relationship this has happened why why how could it have happened and you find the cause of anything happening what will happen next what is the effect this cause and effect as a linear relationship is what the middle part of the mind is constantly engaged in it employs for this purpose two kinds of logic which many of you may be familiar with the deductive logic and the inductive logic the deductive logic tells us this whole wall is blue this is part of the wall therefore it's blue absolutely certain it adds to no new knowledge the inductive log- logic says it in, it's inductively an inference which says this wall is blue and turns around there we suppose it must be blue so probably that is blue and leaves us in doubt 
Logic either gives us no new knowledge or gives us knowledge with doubt. It has never gone beyond that. The middle part of the mind is constantly engaged in doing that. The top part of the, part of the mind we call the creative mind. The creative mind creates nothing but rearranges the same elements of perception which have been picked up by the sensing mind, reserved in the subconscious, picked up from there, mixed with something contemporary and then make new patterns and we say, what a creative person that is, what a creative mind that is. This sensing, reasoning and creating mind, they are the same mind for performing these functions in these three modes. The point to remember is, this part of consciousness which is doing this cannot perform except in time and space. You cannot have a sense perception except with a duration. You cannot say, I saw this cup without saying, I saw it, it took me one minute or half a minute or one second to see it. You cannot say about any thought that you have, it had no duration. Every thought has a time duration, a space ordinate to it and a cause and effect tied up with it. Every creative activity of the mind also is bound up by the time, space, cause and effect framework. The mind has never functioned outside this framework. And yet there is part of consciousness, part of every human consciousness that is constantly functioning outside of this. What about intuition? What about a sudden hunch we get? I do it, but I don't know how. I never thought of it. It just came. Where does that come from? Is that not part of consciousness? It's certainly not part of mind. Yet it has come. Intuition escapes from these three categories of the mind. What about love? It does not fall in this category at all. When you feel so identifying with another person, when you feel so close that you can't help it, you don't know how it happened. When it happened, it is not a function of the mind. What about beauty? You open the window and see a beautiful scene. What's happened to make it beautiful? Is it the analysis that you make? You start counting whether the trees are tall or the buildings are short that makes the scene beautiful? No. In fact, if you start counting the trees and say, where is the beauty? The beauty disappears. What is it that gives us the experience in consciousness of intuition, of love, of beauty, joy, faith? What about these elements? Where are they coming from? Not from the mind. The mind has no role in them. And yet we forget this. The Eastern mystics brought us to this point. Please recognize that your soul, your spirit, your real self, your consciousness is not the mind. The mind is performing functions in time and space and none of these functions of intuition, love, beauty, joy, faith occur in time and space. You can never pinpoint what the cause was, what the effect is. You can comment upon it. You can have a hunch and say, I know it. And somebody says, how? Uh, let me think. Then you can bring thought to be a commentator, to be a narrator of what happened. But you cannot create intuition. You cannot say, I am going to think hard and come up with a new intuitive design. You can never do it. The intuitive design comes first from nowhere with no pinpointed place in the matrix of time and space and then we can use the mind to comment upon it, to analyze it. The mind does analysis. Analysis means in a very crude definition, analysis is breaking and ripping off to see what is there. You analyze anything, how do you analyze? You have to analyze by parts. If you look at the very process of analysis, there is no other way to analyze except by ripping it apart. On the other hand, there is a thing called synthesis to take a total view, to forget the parts and take a total view, to enjoy a painting from a distance. So you see the whole painting is not analysis, it is synthesis, putting together oneness, joint integrity. But when you want to analyze, you might as well cut up that painting into small pieces and put them on a table and watch where is the painting. You cut up into strips, you don't see the painting anymore. But that's what we are doing with life. In order to get a full view of life, we must live with the spirit, with our souls. When we live with the mind, we are cutting up the life into strips of days and nights and this and that, here and there, these moments and that moment. A person who says, I live moment by moment, is cutting up life into moments. A person who says, every day is a new day, I have to wonder and wait what is going to happen, is cutting up the integrity of life into small pieces. And that's the function of the mind. How can you make that life happy? 
how can you get the best out of life by living a life with the mind in that way? Therefore, in this drama of life, the mystic's message is very simple from the East. Put your attention together and have a total look at things. Don't look at it in parts, but in totality. Live a life of spirit and live a life relying upon intuition, relying upon love, relying upon beauty, joy, and faith. If these are the elements on which you base your decisions and your life, you'll never go wrong. You'll go up and up and you'll be happy ever after. They don't say you'll be happy ever after in the next life. You'll be happy ever after in this life, right from now when you start doing it. And if you don't, and if you want to still say, I want to reason out, I have to argue and reason out everything. Till I am convinced with my own thoughts, how can I go ahead? How can you, you must convince me first. If we are always waiting to be convinced, what will happen? Then we are living with these three modes of the mind. And each one of those modes leaves us with two very negative experiences. When we think hard of a thing, more and more possibilities come up. When we analyze them, even more, still more possibilities come up. The options, the alternatives, the possibilities, the probability and the possibility. We get into that trap of the probable and the possible by analysis and by using the mind. If you live with possibilities and probabilities, you get two negative elements in your consciousness which are very difficult to get rid of. One is called doubt. You're not sure. You say, how can I be sure? Is it this or that? And then Eastern mystic comes, he talks, and we say, he's very dogmatic. Look at him, he's so sure of what he's saying. Doesn't he realize there are some other alternatives? We even cast doubt and we try to put that doubt into that man's mind who says, I can see as clear as crystal what's going on. Why do you want to create doubt in my mind? Because I know it. I am not saying what I have heard or read. I am saying what I have seen, what I personally know. Why do you want to contradict me? He says, no, but he doesn't see the other side. There's always another side to a thing, to the picture. And we are creating a doubt for ourselves and we want to spread doubt rather than spread love. The second negative element that comes following doubt is fear. We are afraid. We may take a wrong step. We are afraid. We may be brainwashed. We are afraid something wrong is going to happen. We are afraid what will happen tomorrow. We know that the cause of all fear is ignorance. Cause of all fear is not knowing what will happen. If we know what is going to happen, we are not afraid. Very interesting experiments were held in India in the Kamau, in the Kamau Hills where they have a lot of tigers. Man-eating tigers, man-eating panthers and tigers there. And they decided to see whether people, men are afraid of tigers or not. And they put a lot of people, hunters and others, experts were there to protect them. They had what was called machans, tall uh, sca scaffold kind of build, uh, structures where they could take safety because the tiger could not climb on top. And yet some of them would walk freely. They, after 30 days of experimentation with a lot of people, they found that those who did not know where the tiger was were the most frightened. Those who knew where the tiger was were not frightened at all. And this was a very strange thing because people expected the opposite result, that when you know there is a tiger in the forest, you'll be frightened. But if you knew where the tiger was, you knew what to do. But when you did not know where the tiger was, where is going to come out from, you were so frightened. That experiment shows the nature of our fear in life. We are not afraid of what we can see. We are afraid of what we cannot see. And doubt is one that creates that wall that we can't see. And doubt makes us afraid of things that are not to be feared at all. I once asked a group uh, in, in the 60s, please prepare a list of at least 10 items of which you are afraid. Let's see what you are afraid of. Let's say tomorrow morning if you go out, what are you afraid of? They wrote an accident may happen. We may hear bad news. We may... They wrote out things. I said, all right, after two months, let's see how many of those things have happened. After six months, how many of those things have happened? Nothing happened. Which means we are not only afraid, we are afraid of things that never happen. Supposing they happen once, we expect them every day in 100 days. If there are 10 items, 1,000 times we are afraid. Even if one thing happens, we have been frightened 1,000 times more than was necessary. What kind of life is this? And yet we live this, this life every day. We are afraid. Afraid, what is she going to say? Afraid, what is he going to say? 
afraid of opinions. Forget actual attacks on you. Uh, afraid of accident, I can understand. We are afraid of what they will say. We are so frightened of what they will say of public opinion that we change our entire life to protect ourselves from that fear. And then we, at, at the end, after modifying our life, our making ourselves miserable, we go to them and say, you know, we changed all this. We were afraid you might say this. And they say we were never going to say it anyway. You wasted your time and you just uh, burnt yourself up in fear. So this fear and doubt that has become such a part of our life is being created essentially because we are living with our mind and not with our spirit. If we could live with our spirit and have more reliance on some things that are so certain. There are very few things in life which take the doubt and fear uh, away. But intuition is one. Love is another. Beauty is another. You will see that in life. You live your life by, with these guidelines and you take fear and doubt away. People used to wonder how with the teacher that I had in India, the great master, how his disciples were fearless. They were never afraid. They were willing to face anything. They were willing to do anything. How come? What therapy did they get to get over fear? They got no therapy except get tanned under the sun of the great master. Except get the sunshine of his love. And that sunshine and love affected them to a point when they were fearless. There was nothing to be afraid of. When you are in the thoughts of the beloved, when you are having the thoughts of the beloved, what can you be afraid of? It's a totally different approach to life. And so in this great drama of life, which we are trying to live through willy-nilly, we can make the best of it by first of all distinguishing between living with the mind and living with the spirit and trying to live our life with the spirit. The second aspect of this drama is, do we take it as a drama at all? Are we conscious that this world is a large theater and we are stage actors on it? If we become conscious of this, that this is a big stage and we are acting on it, our life is transformed instantly from that moment. But we are taking it too real. By taking it as real, we are getting into real unhappiness, real pain, real suffering. And if we knew that this is a role we have to play, and we have to play that role because we have the script in our hand of that particular role, we get out of this pain and unhappiness. We act unhappy, we act pained, but we don't have the unhappiness and not the pain. Did you know you could take away pain and unhappiness that simply? Have you tried it out? Try it out now. It's a challenge to all of you. Just try, keep this consciousness in your head that this is a stage. I am playing a role because I am a mother. I have to play a mother's role. Because I'm a son, I have to play a son's role. Because I'm an employee here, I am playing that employee's role. Because I'm the boss, I'm playing the boss's role. Because I'm a friend, I'm playing a friend's role. That it is all on the stage and we are playing roles. And what I'm speaking in that role is a script given and handed over to me by a director whom I can't see right now, hope to meet him later and say, change the script next time. <laughs> Let us have that consciousness, that awareness that we are on a stage and acting and try out and see, does it keep you in the same pain, in the same unhappiness, in the same sadness you have lived through? I have tested it out many times before. It doesn't. It changes the life and gives you a happiness and a bounciness you have never had before. So try it out. If you know this is a stage and you know you have to act your part on the stage and you actually act, what will happen? The biggest change that will take place, if you constantly keep this awareness, this is a drama, this is a stage show, I am an actor, we all collectively are not only actors but also the audience. It's a strange, well-integrated drama going on in the stage. We have the audience and the actors at the same time. Let me concentrate on my acting role. I'll watch out as an audience later on. If you can then act well your part, as Alexander Pope says, that is where the honor is. Honor and shame from no condition rise. Act well your part, there all the honor lies. Of course, the greatest merit of this line is the rhyme. You know that Alexander Pope was a great rhymester. He was such a great rhymester that his father didn't like it. When he was a little child, he used to make rhymes all the time. His father spanked him sometimes. And once he spanked him, if you ever make rhymes anymore, I am really going to hit you. And little Alexander said, Papa, Papa, pity take, verses shall I never make. <laughs> he couldn't help it at that time. 
But what he said about honor and shame and that acting well our part is our role in life is so important that if we can know what our role is and act our part, we change our nature of life because of a development in us of a new thing which is called detachment and objectivity. I have not known any other way to make that a part of life, to obtain an attitude of detachment and objectivity except by playing a role and knowing it's a drama. Because attachments come when we think it's real. All the attachments are arising from our taking this show as not a show but a reality. If we were to act our parts well, we would know it is not real, that we have to step off and go away, then we will experience detachment. You know that most of the Eastern philosophers have recommended for spiritual progress, you must be detached from this world. We hear it. Then we try to practice detachment. How? I don't want to be attached to you. Get away from me. You, I don't want to think of you. I'm detached. I'm on a spiritual path. Can you attain detachment like that? If you try to push things away to which you are attached, do you get detached? Do you remember that American seeker who heard of a great yogi sitting on the mountains tops of the Himalayas? And he heard from that yogi, from people of followers of the yogi here, that that yogi has a special mantra, special magical words. If you repeat those words, you get immediate emancipation and salvation from this world. You know how Americans want instant knowledge and instant realization. So he said it's a good trip to make to the Himalayas. So off he went on a TWA flight and landed up there, drove up the Himalayas, went and saw that little simple looking yogi sitting outside his cave on the mountains. And he went to the master and said, Master, I hear that you have a special mantra, special words, magical words, that if we repeat those words, that we can get salvation. He said, of course, my child, I have those words. He said, will you share them with me? He said, of course, you have come thousands of miles to see me. I will share those words. Come close, I will tell you that mantra. So the seeker approached him and the master whispered in his ear. He says, those magical words are abracadabra. He said, what? I have come all this distance just to hear abracadabra from you? He said, those are the magical words. There is only one little condition attached. When next time you say abracadabra in a quiet place, don't think of bananas. The man came away. Every time he tried to say abracadabra, the bananas come in front of me. He tried very hard. Bananas don't come in front of me. The harder he said, the more they came in front of me. That yogi proved a point. You cannot get detachment by pushing something away to which you are attached. There is no way. Nobody has yet achieved detachment by practicing detachment. I know of no one like this in the world. That I practice detachment, therefore I become objective and detached. It hasn't happened. The only way we know of getting detachment is by practicing attachment. Attachment to something else. You are attached to A, practice attachment to B, you get detached to A. That's the only way you get detachment. To get real detachment from this world, you must practice attachment to something other than this world. There is no other way. And to talk of the importance of detachment but not, not knowing how to do it is no good. People are talking of it and not practicing it because nobody ever taught them how to practice it. Now, how, how do we attach ourselves to something not of this world? Well, if we know this world is a drama, it's a stage play, then let's attach ourselves to somebody who is not on the stage. Somebody is off stage. Maybe in the green room, in the changing room, even in the restroom doesn't matter, but should not be on the stage. If there is somebody who is not on the stage and we can get attached, we will have detachment in this world. Let's look for somebody who is not on the stage. We look around all our friends, we look at all the people around us, we look at all the things around us, they are all in the world. Where is something that is not in this world? Where is somebody, some person, something, some idea that is not in this world? As we go through the list of things, we find that people from the beginning have been worshipping, admiring, adulating things of this world. They have been attaching themselves to this world. Even in the name of God, they have been attaching themselves to this world. Even to go to a church, we go to a place which we can see a building outside. To go to a temple, we go to an outside thing on the world, on the stage. How can we get detached? 
How do we find something that is not in this world to be attached to? This is where, again, the Eastern mystics came to our help. Think of this world, away from it, and not talk just from reading some books about it, but from personal experience. Do you have a real alien, a visitor, E.T., somebody who is coming really from outside this show? Have you ever met anybody who is from outside this show? And we say, we don't know. What about a person whose consciousness travels in flight, in actual conscious flight into regions of experience that do not belong to this physical world? What about masters who have been able to collect their attention behind the eyes, taken it out of the body, experienced dying while living and have flown into other regions and come back into the body and spoken to us and shared with us what's going on there, would that be a good example? We say, sure. But how do we find such a person? It's very tough. We find a lot of people who claim to be masters, who come in our lives, but when we want to talk to them of the other life, they want dollar bills, good in this world, to take us to the other life. But surely, if they want a check or a dollar bill written in this world, how could they belong to another wealthy world? But there are some people. By definition, there are perfect living masters, very rare, but available to us, who belong to an experience that does not come on this earth stage at all. Who belong to an experience and live their life day by day, minute by minute, all the time, in an experience that is not of this world. And yet they can walk in our midst, become human and ordinary like us, and meet us and talk to us, and yet they speak of their life outside the stage. What if we got attached to one of those? If you got attached to one of those, surely you are practicing detachment from this world. If you live a life in which you are detached from the world, take it as a show, live your life according to the duties, obligations and roles, role models laid down in the script that you have been handed down, live your life like that and have your attachment, your love, your thinking, your innermost attention focused on the beloved who is from another region of consciousness. You made it. So they made it simple. That find a human being who can talk to you as if he is a visitor. He's just coming on the stage for a chat, for a dialogue, but actually lives somewhere else. And he can talk about where he lives. And he can share that with you. And he can occasionally hold your hand and take you there. How about that? That would be great if a person can do that. You would automatically fall in love with such a person. How would you help it? That is the answer they give to the problem of detachment on this stage of this great drama of this world. It's very difficult to find those people. In fact, these very people, these great masters tell us it is impossible to find them. I am saying very difficult. They say it's impossible because they live too humanly. They are too human, too much like us. And we can't therefore recognize them. They can find us. We can't find them because they can see. They see the stage, they see the other side of the stage, which we can't see. They have practiced dying while living. So they have seen what's on the other side and are still living with us in the same body. Therefore, they can share this with us. So how do we find them? Once there was a bunch of blind people trapped in a room. You know, the room had wall, flush walls like this, and even the door was flush. Nobody knew where the handle of the door was, nor did they know whether to push the door or to open. And they went crawling all those blind people went groping in the dark. They couldn't see. Where is the door? There must be a door to get out. Will anybody with eyes come in and help us? They were shouting like that because none of them could help each other. They were all blind. Then somebody heard a door creak and somebody walked in. They knew an enlightened person has come, one with eyes, one who can see. Let's find him, they said. He's in our midst now. Let's find him. And they went on groping. They did not realize that being blind, how could they find him? He had eyes, he was seeing all of them doing this. He had eyes, he was looking at what they are doing, the blind people. So he, when he found one who was so restless and so intense in his seeking, that he went round and round the wall, more keen than the others, this man who had eyes and who could see, came in front of him and stretched his hands in front, and the blind man got them. I knew I will find you one day. I knew I will find you. Who found who? The blind man thought he found the man with eyes. In fact, the man with eyes, with compassion, 
and love for the blindness of that person stretched out his hands and was found. Such is the truth of these perfect living master that I refer to. They have eyes to see. They know our past, present and future before we have ever seen them or heard of them. And when they come into our life, they come through a process of coincidence and stretch their hands in a way we can grasp them and say, we found, we knew all the time one day we are going to find you. They timed the finding. They came in our life when we were ready. That is why in the East, they don't say that find a guru. No, nobody said that. When the chela is ready, the guru appears. When we are ready, the master appears. Such is the truth. And I have seen that happen all over the world. When we are ready, the perfect master who is to guide us appears in our life through a strange process we called coincidence. Because we can't explain coincidence. It goes against the laws of probability. It goes against logic. And therefore, they find that a very suitable way of getting in to show you that it is not the mind that could find them. So having found such a person and falling in love, being attached to the person, it becomes much easier to see that this whole world is a big theater, big show going on, and we are merely players. Then we play our part well, we get the best out of this life, and with the friend we have found now, the new friend who's come from our own home, which we forgot. We forgot that that was our home. We are so embroiled in this drama here, in this stage, we forgot where we come from. Don't we ever worry and wonder? We are here, we were born here, we are growing up, things are happening automatically, there are parents, children, friends, employers, employees, jobs, world, wars, peace, peace movements, war movements, everything going on around us without our control, we are not even directing it, placed right in the middle, what's going on? Why did we come here? Did we choose to come here? Is there a purpose? Who is going to take us out? Don't we wonder over these things? And we get no answers. At least somebody can come and say, you've forgotten where you came from. Come, I'll take you back. This is temporary. Haven't you seen others going? Didn't you see so many came and so many went away? You'll also go from here. Don't you want to know where you will go? Perfect living master introduces us to a permanent home, to our real home from where we came in the first place and have forgotten. So this advantage of finding one who becoming like us, coming to us like us, can help us out, is the greatest miracle I've ever seen in existence. That there can be this consciousness that can become human just like us and then yet have contact with our real home and take us out from this show and this drama. There's nothing greater than that that I have experienced. But a problem comes up. These human beings whom we call masters, perfect living masters, they are too human for our liking. We want them to be superhuman. If they come without wearing an S on their vests, we don't like them. They are so ordinary. They dress like us. They eat like us. They talk like us. They are born like us. They die like us. They get sick like us. They go to hospital like us. They are too much like us for our liking. We want them to be great up in a pedestal. But they don't want to come like that. And they know why. If they came up on a pedestal, Supposing they came up flying in the air here. There is a master, real master. Why? Because he can fly in the sky. And we are all waiting for him. And the master enters and flies three feet above the ground. How would we react? I can tell you, if you really saw that, some will faint. Some will faint at this very thing. Some will think, no, there must be some wires. Let's check, it, check him out. Some will say, wow, this is so frightening. Others will say, it's wonderful, it's great, it's awesome. We will use many words to describe our awe and fear and surprise, but none will say, I love you. Not possible. Yet, if while performing the trick, the master fell down, from the front row, two people will run and say, are you hurt? And those two will be the one experiencing the first flavor of love for a human being. Do you realize the importance of being human in order to experience love? And love is the principal vehicle of spirituality. Why should they come as magicians? Why should they not come exactly like us? If they are superhuman, they should act like they are less than human. Then we will make friends with them and be able to love them. And they will be like us. Therefore, these masters are so absolutely human and yet in their consciousness are so absolutely beyond human. They combine these two things, which is a rare 
rare experience to have to meet them, that they can combine these two things. But in a country or in countries where we have grown up with values of democracy and equality, it is very difficult to accept that there can be another human being and we pretend to say, he is a master. How can you accept another human being like yourself as a master when all are equal? Many people are standing on the, on the ridge, standing on the fringe, standing on the border on this question alone. And I know it. People are standing on this. Well, I want to, I want to meet God. I know God is my creator. And I experience his presence. You have to experience because he's inside all the time. How can somebody say, I experience the presence of God as a unique event when God is in each one of us at all the time while we are alive and conscious. He never leaves us. To say, I today experience the presence of God only means the mind had some vibrations and thought, well, I'm having a new experience. Mind is making up a game. God is always with us. What is strange about these people is they don't have to rely upon these vague impressions. They have communication, the hotline all the time. We don't. But we say, no, we want to have direct contact with God. We don't want that agent. We don't want a middleman. We don't want somebody intermediaries. Does God require intermediaries? Why can't they come to us directly? It's a good, legitimate question. And the answer is equally surprising. God never comes through an intermediary. He always comes directly and always comes from within us. He doesn't come through a person. He comes from inside. Nobody has ever found God outside. Whoever has ever discovered God or even the reality of that power which we call the creative power or our total self has found from within ourselves. The whole of the truth is within ourselves. There is nothing outside to find. And what's the importance of that person? The importance is we don't know how to go within. We have lost contact with our own total self. We have lost contact with what we are, what is inside us. Our soul is inside, our God is inside, and we never communicate. What kind of relationship is that? At least something happens outside in the form of another human being who is different from the other human beings. He makes us realize what the truth is inside us. One great Swami from India once came to this country and spoke in Chicago many years ago. His name was Swami Vivekananda. While speaking to the World Congress of Religions, he said to the people, for three days, I have been telling you that all this world that you see is mithya, maya, illusion. I've been trying to convince you that whatever you are seeing is illusion, not real. How come if I am telling you that everything is unreal, then I should pretend to be telling you the truth because I must also be unreal. If everything you are seeing is unreal, you are seeing me, I must also be unreal then my words must also be unreal. How come on the one hand I am telling you everything is unreal, on the other hand I am telling you listen to this unreality? How do you resolve this contradiction? And he gave his own answer. He said the truth is I am as unreal as the rest of the world. My words are as unreal as the rest of the world with one difference. The rest of the world pulls you out to unreality and keeps you there. This unreality pushes you back into yourself and lets you have a chance to see reality. That both are unreal. What we call a human being as a perfect living master is as unreal, as dreamy, as much of a dream character as the rest of it. When we wake up, he disappears. But while he's there, he's in a position because of the role he's playing of his consciousness being in contact with the other world or the higher world. He plays that role to bring us to our own reality within ourselves, not within him. Therefore, he becomes so lovable. He is such a darling as, a, as, a, as an experience outside in this world, not because of what he is giving us, but of what he is letting us know what we can find within our own self. When we go in meditation within ourselves, after getting the tips and getting the roadmap from him, when we go within, we are surprised that he is there. Not only are we surprised that he is there, we find that he was always there. We also find that he took that form outside as an experience to enable us to find him within and he was the real master within all the time. But without him, how could we find him inside? Some people say, well, once you find the master inside, give up the one outside. There's no use. 
redundant. Well, if the if it was a business transaction, we might fire the outside guru. Well, you served your purpose. We don't want to pay you anymore. You're fired. I found the real one. But this is not a business relationship. It's a relationship of love. When you have found through love what the reality of the guru is inside you, when you open your eyes and see him again, wow, he looks even more beautiful than he ever did before. Because you see what he did to us and what his reality was. And even in illusion, he looks beautiful. Even in the mirror, he looks beautiful. Like a Chinese emperor once set up a competition between artists to wall paint, a beautiful painting. And he said, he called the Japanese a artist and the Chinese artist. Whichever artist produces a better painting will be given a reward. He put a curtain in the middle. He said, you shouldn't see each other. You do this wall, Chinese do this wall, Japanese do this wall. And he drew a big curtain in the middle and nobody should cheat and look at the other person's painting. The Chinese set out with the best brushes and their fine paints and all kinds of lovely colors and they made the beautiful painting. The Japanese went on scrubbing the wall. He had given them only seven days to complete the work. Second, day two arrived. Chinese had already progressed to half the wall. The Japanese were still scrubbing. Day three, day four, day five arrived. They had almost completed the painting and given final touches. The Japanese are still scrubbing the wall. And the emperor said, aren't you going to paint? They said, we'll be ready in time. What is the time for the judgment? The ju judging will take place at 11 o'clock tomorrow. Are you ready? We'll be ready by 11 o'clock tomorrow. And they kept on scrubbing. Ultimately, this painting was complete. And the king came. He said, let me see the Chinese first. He said, that's great painting. Now, what the Japanese had done was nothing but to scrub the wall, mirrors smooth. And he said, remove the curtain. And they removed the curtain. And the reflection of that fell, a deep reflection. He said, this is even better. And the Japanese got the reward. The question is, sometimes we forget that the illusion can be even prettier than the reality when we know how it is being created. I tell you, the greatest beauty of life on this drama is to know what the reality is and yet live here. You enjoy the best of both worlds. People used to tell me, you can't eat the cake and have it too. In spiritual path, you can. Thank you very much.